Well, welcome everybody to episode two in Evenings of Faith. Uh, tonight, we're very privileged to have with us uh, John David Mooney, who's an internationally recognized artist and also a member of our parish and a resident of our neighborhood. He is famous mainly for his large-scale public sculptures that kind of draw on the, the location and the environment and, and use interdisciplinary um, kinds of elements in, in creating art. Uh, his art is on display at numerous public and private galleries, including the um, Museum of Modern Art in New York City and our own Art Institute in Chicago. Um, he's taught at, and lectured at numerous academic institutions here and abroad, but perhaps one of his great achievements has been um, the John David Mooney Foundation, in which he's mentored artists from everywhere for like 40 years, sharing his <laughs> gifts uh, with people who are beginning the process. So we're very honored, John David. You know, um, I realize so much of what we do is a puzzle to try to put all these mysterious pieces and, and parts together. And uh, <clears throat> we have uh, three godchildren. And I didn't know what to get them, so let me end up building a Lego pyramid, which is a very difficult, which I did not know, <laughs> thing to put together. And very expensive, which I didn't know. <laughs> uh, like $125. So they were thrilled when they got it. And I kept getting from all three of these young men. The oldest is 15, and then I think 12 and, and uh, 10. They all got into this. And they worked on it and worked on it. And last week, I received uh, all the photographs that they had completed this. And they were thrilled. Then a thank you note from them. They really enjoyed it. They stuck with it. They stayed with this impossible puzzle to make this pyramid, even the pharaoh's tomb was inside, and all, all the intricacies with it. And then, uh, a couple who actually are very generous to the foundation uh, had a love of puzzles. And that's the type of the paper puzzles on the table where you put the pieces together, which I would never do. <laughs> they were too hard. But uh, they enjoyed it, and they did, they did very difficult puzzles, I thought. And uh, the wife of the, had, had a love of uh, unicorns. And then we found that the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York had a unicorn puzzle, which is part of the, the tapestry collection there. It was a very major uh, tapestry. Beautiful. And I thought, oh, they would like this. You know, they wanted, they love unicorns. And they spent, you know, I guess a day or two, and they then gave it to their family in Puerto Rico. <laughs> uh, it's too hard, too difficult. Would not stay with them. I kind of think that may be where we are uh, uh, as uh, followers propagating the message of Jesus Christ. <sighs> For some, it's really difficult, and they put it aside, and they'll leave the whole thing, and move on to something else. But it's not, it's, but for others, it's easy, the commitment is there, that they fully become part of this body of Christ. And that kind of, to me, is a mystery of where we are. Um, they, um, uh, 
the sense of beauty has been one of the mysteries and definitions of man, what distinguishes us from others is that we can comprehend and contemplate on beauty. We are uh, able to imagine and we can construct around a mystery. So others uh, other civilizations have also had the hunger for the divine. And they translate that in forms of beauty. And you all know that the Parthenon is simply one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. It creates a, a sense of the sacredness by having everything on a horizontal plane. So to the Greeks, horizontality was sacred. And it translate, translated it into a, a complete uh, message. And they, and they brought their stories of the gods to life within the replication of the human form done very, very well, fully formed, uh, even, did, as you see, within the, the, the uh, drapery, you know, it, that appears as, as if that is a white gown draping over, over the figure. It's, it is beautiful, and they consider doing this so important that they put it on a hill, on the Acropolis. It's there for everybody to see. The Romans took this method of honoring the divine and built upon it, changing the scale a bit, uh, by making it larger uh, and um, more uh, intertwined within daily life. The Jewish religion was iconoclastic in that they did not believe in any images. What they were able to do is make an image with the Word. The Word was God. And they were able to translate that into the Word. The Christian religion comes out of the Jewish tradition. It, is, it was a Jewish faith. And so they're starting from scratch. Uh, and it is uh, blown into a full expression of, of, the, of the best that man has been able to make, right, within Western civilization, within that framework. <clears throat> and uh, I, th I think about A proclamation to the divine, say what's in Chicago, or even Milwaukee, where would we look? Can we look? Can we see it within our urban environment? Is it there? Well, I think that taking a look on the horizon of, of any Chicago landscape or Milwaukee landscape, you will see the strongest 
proclamation of the belief in Jesus Christ. What is that? That's the pillars of all the churches. Put those together. That silhouette is amazing. <clears throat> Subtract all the other things that, that are distracting you either today. This is one huge, strong statement. 150 years ago, for the most part, so you average it out, out to that. This, this church is young. It's only about 120 years old. Uh, but all within that framework. And I love this facade because it refers back to Santa Maria Novella in Florence. But what about these steeples? And this has been going on for a long time, 150 years ago. Now, the population wasn't as large then as it is now, it keeps growing. And the Catholic population keeps decreasing. What, what, what do we have? How, how can this be changed? Very possibly, it is one to go back to basics. Go back to what Peter and Paul and all that you find in the Acts of laying out the essentials, contemplating those essentials, and then building upon them. And that is what art has done in the history of, of uh, of, of, of Christian art. So, uh, you know, it, it's... What do we mean by Christian art in the first place? So, uh, and I was thinking of this as the future of Christian art. Big question mark. Big question mark. Is it crystal-centered? Does it center on Christ? And, and the, the, the saving message of redemption through Christ. Um, is, is it, um, <laughs> we don't talk during the day much about Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Redeemer, I don't think. Even probably uh, privately or even among ourselves. But it's necessary. We've been called to be disciples. We've been called to promulgate, to announce, to convert. Art can help in that process. It is a crutch that leads us to the divine. So, um, you know, it's Plato uh, wrote about beauty, which I think is a good place to start because what well, is a pagan religion, right? The soul is awe-stricken and shudders at the sight of the beautiful, for it feels that something is evil, in that it was not imparted to it from without by the senses, but has always been already laid down there in the deeply unconscious region of the mind, it's deeply unconscious this sense of beauty that everybody has. Uh, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Christians. And 
actually the Christians kind of, as I said, had to start from scratch. Uh, it's kind of like Altamira. They had to do cave paintings. <laughs> they actually went in the caves to do the cave paintings and started putting their hands on the walls and, and doing some drawing. Um, uh, and this, these are the first expressions uh, coming out of an iconoclastic religion. And that is that they began to relate to the philosophical Greeks and to, and to the Roman environment in, in which they were in. And so they began to use those farms uh, and, and began to really work with them. And as we, all of you know, you know that a common uh, image which is used uh, to refer to Christ often is the good, the good shepherd. Uh, and uh, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> It's part of the mystery. Um, so these are. Thank you. Um, Lonergan, um, a, a Jesuit Canadian priest, oh, no, I did created it. quite a, uh, no, I did a, a philosophy. Um, and one of the things is that you can advance through absolutely statues that were already in existence and gave new meaning to it. So the uh, the statues of shepherds with their sheep and so forth uh, were uh, t taken and used, appropriated to refer to Christ. But after they go through this phase of appropriation, they move on to invention <coughs> and all that they can able to be able to uh, e explore from, from that from the invention. Now it's, again, it took a long time uh, that there is no art there is no aspect of, of uh, a, a way to, to show the love of God and the saving power that Christ is presenting. How did you do that? Well, they, they, they started very well. Uh, and uh, you see, it was all, it was. 430 years after the time of Christ that we know that the crucifixion. The first ones are on, on these bow relief panels on the doors of Santa Sabina in Rome. The first time that there was a crucifixion portrayed. And that was done with the two things on either side of Christ. Excuse me a minute, John David. There's seats in the front. I know some of you are Catholic, but you can come closer. <laughs> <laughs> and my voice may not be able to get to you uh, well, about the technical aspect, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep kind of going. This, this is going to be just a quick history. Boom, 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 slides, okay? We're not, we're not going to do a, a history of Christian art. It's going to be more like a, a film that you've seen uh, maybe on Netflix recently. <laughs> uh, uh, Conk on Earth, has anybody seen it? Conk on Earth, yeah. on Earth, okay, good. So this is Conk on Earth in, 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 in terms of, of Christian art. If you haven't seen it and you want a good laugh, uh, and find a bit of truth in it, uh, it, it it's worthwhile. Um, the next, uh, the, the next full body uh, in the round, three-dimensional uh, crucifixion is another 300 years later. Uh, and uh, in Luca, 
That's a, a long time, 700 years from the time of Christ. And then you, you see uh, the uh, little manuscript, uh, which is uh, another 700 years after that in France. So that that is a, a, a tiny... That's alive. That was live. Thanks, <laughs> Beth. All oh, right. Um, so yeah, we got it together. And, and then 900 years, uh, 200 years more, is this beautiful uh, cross in from Germany and from Cologne. So there is a lot of time here, uh, and so that is a redeeming notion that, that makes me feel good. Um, the, uh, the, the, this, this manuscript is also uh, of, of that earlier period of time. And uh, the uh, going back in time to painting, this is probably one of the very earliest uh, at, at uh, Santa Gudenziana uh, in Rome. And I think it, it's the lower half which was earlier painted because that's why that slide is at the bottom. The cross goes on to it at, at, at a later time. And then all of a sudden, a little bit of distance away, but you can come into the uh, exploration of the East, and the influence of the artist in Istanbul, Constantinople, you have a new flower. And this is of, um, of Justinian and his wife, Theodora, in Ravenna, stunningly, stunningly beautiful. And in the center is Christ of Pantophrater, in majesty, Christ in majesty, which is a very, very important invention that they were able to uh, come to. Also, the depiction, remember that they all knew all about Greek art. They were active artists. They all knew about Roman art. They knew how to define in three-dimensionality. But they invented a two-dimensional aspect, which is just stunning. So this invention it begins to become really important. And you start looking at it in, even in terms of architecture. Uh, under uh, Hadrian, uh, at, it started in 80 AD, they built the Pantheon. The Pantheon is amazing in that it is the largest dome structure ever to be built. And all of this under one dome. Um, and it's really neat when it's raining, you can go in and get wet. Uh, right through the <laughs> oculus. Uh, but watching the sun uh, is, is, is also a great observatory for the seasons of the year uh, uh, and, and being able to mark uh, the solstices and the equinoxes, which 1,500 years later, Michelangelo did that in, in his uh, last work of uh, uh, on, on the churches in Rome, but you may come alive. So 500 years after the Pantheon was built, there was a pandemic, as bad as the pandemic that we just went through. They, uh, history records three million people had died, or that was five million people had died, in this pandemic. But the Emperor Justinian, who we just saw, 
wanted to create something better than the Pantheon, that Constantinople could have something more than Rome had. And the Church of Hagia Sophia, uh, minus the minarets, uh, was that statement. It, it is important for lots of reasons within the art world, and that's the first signed building that we know. Uh, is, it, is the door uh, of uh, Miletus and Antinias of Trollet were the two architects. Why, why did they get such recognition? So the design? Yes. They said that, that they were able to maintain this dome up in the air through buttressing. Uh, and cre they created a pendentive. That was the great invention here, is that pendentive that comes out like this and holds up that dome. Well, um, the the uh, I, I when I when I look at it, you know, I I just marvel. You you know that they sadly, uh, Aragon has uh, taken it back from being a museum, which we could kind of uh, take in, in in the neutral position and has created it as a mosque again. So it, it doesn't it ha you don't have the, f the freedom to to move through it as uh, as we used to. But it is it it marks such a turning point. Besides the design they did it in five years. 10,000 workers in five years. That's why Isidore and, and, and uh, Antimaeus are well known, because they were able to, to make that supply system and people together to do this in a short time in the middle of a pandemic. The next flowering is the invention of the Gothic cathedral, another 500 years after that. So Abbe Suger in Paris defines what a new architecture is going to be, breaking the French tradition of the horizontality and reaching up to God, going vertically. And the first thing that they did was hire artists. Even though this was an engineering fee and one full of beauty, they also had just invented the capability of making mass flames of glass. And they could have let daylight in, unviolated. But no, they violated it with art. They hired the artists to add beauty to this space. And in the flowering of that Gothic cathedral style is in short, of course, which it gets refined. But the French still uh, buried their kings and their queens in Saint Denis. So the, the sarcophagi and, and the, are, are amazing. As the light comes through that stained glass falling over all these stone figures. The next 500 years, so this is our savior. This is how I kind of redeem ourselves. We're someplace in the middle of one of these 500 year periods. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is the Duomo. Uh, the Brunelleschi design was able by chains to be able to hold up a dome. Uh, 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 and it, again, it was a church just full of artists. Giotto, Cimabue, Brunelleschi, uh, all, all, all were at work. Brunelleschi, by the way, is important to painters 
because he was able to make three point vanishing point perspective. We did not have that mathematically worked out until we were less. So now he was able to make a dome pretty strong. Uh, he, he really was able to make it fly at the same time. Uh, in, a, in a neighboring town, uh, oops, sorry, what, um, in the, in, <laughs> sometimes you don't know how the button works. <laughs> uh, in, in Siena, the painting was first and foremost. The cathedral is, is uh, beautiful. Uh, the city hall is beautiful. All is flowering just like Florence. It's a real competition between the two. Um, and Simone Martini uh, created this my step uh, of the Virgin Mary surrounded by um, all the figures and, and uh, that are necessary to tell the story of, of Christ. So the Virgin Mary now is begin to be put forward first. Then he created another masterpiece, a true masterpiece, the Annunciation. And the whole community was behind it. This altarpiece for this church which is Fabulous because if it's striped, it runs across with it. So it's a vertical church, vertical Italian Gothic, but held down by these horizontal bands. And then you go inside and you have the Simone Bertini altarpiece. That piece was anticipated with such longing by the whole community that they built a wagon that was an art piece in itself, completely decorated. So this wagon was built by the townspeople to go to Simone Martini's uh, studio, put on, put, carry the altarpiece, which is not a far distance at all, from the Martini studio to the Duomo. The whole town came out. It was the biggest celebration that this painting was being brought in. The closest thing that I know that comes close to that is uh, Oshana Seat's windows at Old St. Pat's. Mm -hmm. um, and he went back to Dublin to learn how to make stained glass windows. He had an inside job. He was the husband of the pastor's niece. <laughs> But that helped because he was able to do the entire church himself. No, no competition, no committees, <laughs> nobody to say anything uh, to stop it. So he was able to do the entire church. But they brought the windows, each one after it was completed, down the aisle uh, in church uh, to applause of the entire uh, so they were happy clapping even back then. <laughs> um, so uh, down the road, perfection of the raised dome. Michelangelo was able to take that concept and make it perfectly beautiful, inside and out. You all know it, you all know it, the masterpiece that it is. We have to go another 500 years to find another building that deals with this dome that you've been following from the very beginning, from Hadrian, uh, uh, from, uh, the uh, Pantheon, to Hagia Sophia, to Bunulowski's dome, to St. Peter's, to Max Abramovich's dome in Champion of Edmund, not very far away, um, the assembly hall. Equally important, equally beautiful in terms of its engineering. Two saucers, 
bury half of one saucer, put another saucer on top of it, and it holds. <laughs> and it's a circus inside, a true, a true circus. And I just went to a basketball game the other night. I couldn't believe what, what was going on. There was, occasionally, it, the team came out and played, but there was <laughs> everything else going on. It completely uh, uh, amazed me. Michelangelo, though, uh, prior to his dumping, was asked to do some painting in the barn of a building, the Sistine Chapel, uh, adjacent to the new St. Peter's. And you know that he was able to make a work which stood, stood out over all uh, time I have someplace. Uh, I have a lot of notes. There are all of them. But uh, he realized, this is, I think, understood by earlier artists. We don't have statements from them. But do from the console that he, he's kind of a laborer. He, he, he's allowing the Holy Spirit to guide him. He's a vessel. And artists <coughs> are those vessels in order to be able to create. Uh, when they are able to create great art. They are, they are uh, removing th th themselves and, and allowing <coughs> this magic to happen. Uh, <coughs> you know, art is, a, is the servant of the people. Uh, and it, is, it expresses their basic yearnings and, it, and it's a, a collective will. So the artist becomes a servant. You know, Angelo was a servant. And uh, these servants need to establish beauty in the lived environment for the sake of the people as many people came in to see the Sistine Chapel when it was completed as see it daily today. <sighs> and, you know, yeah, maybe it's a Disneyland of the Vatican, but uh, <laughs> it, it brought people to uh, a new experience. Art for all the people is a human right. It is their right to be able to encounter art, to experience beauty, and to participate in the creation of it. Not Michelangelo, not anybody else, uh, did these things alone. Not only is the Holy Spirit at work, and, and on a, and a, but on a much broader plane in bringing the requests. The artist is working at the request of. They are, we use the term commission, or start to work. <laughs> start working. <laughs> we want this, just figure it out. We don't care, figure it out, start working. That's what an artist does. So, it, it's really important to realize that the art does not come without the patron. The collective patron is the best patron. But it has to come there. In fact, it was an individual piece with one big. I consider that the patron does 60 per, is 60% 60 responsible for the work, at least. So uh, it, it's, it's really key. Oh, we, we got another 500 years, you know. <laughs> what happened? Uh, 
lots have happened. Uh, uh, we took some Indian land, and then we had a civil war, and then there was a war in, in uh, Europe, kind of a really bad one, and all wars, and they're all, and then we had another one, and, and after the Second World War, there was a realization, particularly in France, and particularly by the Dominican priests, that we need to get back to beauty. And so they, they uh, really, really worked on, on, um, on how to do this. And uh, Father Murray, uh, 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 Father Marie Alain Coutier, is a man who I was aware of when I was a child. I collected a magazine that he published in France called Art Sacre, Sacred Art. And that magazine, I just lived for. It's a large format magazine, mostly pictures. And in grade school, this meant more to me than, than anything else. I was unaware of, of the philosophy behind it, the writings. Uh, I, I, but this is an example that I see of uh, his uh, church that got a lot of criticism because he hired a lot of artists. Uh, Roll, Matisse, uh, many, 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 I think there were 20 artists all together. Chagall, Lipschitz did the outside mural, and the inside tapestry over the altar uh, is uh, by uh, Jean Rousseau. It's, it's stunning. A lot of the French artists at the time that they were doing this were atheists, they said. Whatever they said, okay, fine. And then Le Corbusier, the architect of all architects, was commissioned to build another chapel in, in the Alps. Uh, French Alps, Swiss Alps, uh, right on the border. Uh, Ranchon, and he gets this, again, accepted as a Corbu masterpiece. This statement of this world. This church was built for four winds, a wind in every direction. The interior wasn't quite so important because on, on this outdoor um, facade, as you see, on the right, uh, there are two uh, pulpits, two raised pulpits and an altar. He, <coughs> the top two photographs show in two different seasons uh, that altar and the community sat on the hillside. The interior, maybe it, doesn't really speak to the sacred that much, but it's an important statement, uh, and it, it works. Then we have the greatest masterpiece of our time, Matisse's Chapel of the Rosary in Vons, France. It's an interesting thing. In, in uh, 1942, uh, Matisse was really suffering, I think it was cancer, uh, and he left his wife and his son up north, uh, and he left his beautiful place uh, in Nice, where he was doing all this work, and went up above Nice de Vence, and the yellow building on the right is a Dominican rehabilitation facility. 
And so he decided, you know, that's not a bad place. I'll, I'll buy or lease a house across the street from that, which he did. Um, and then he put an ad in the paper, uh, wanted uh, a very pretty nurse uh, who will also be my model. <laughs> And um, God works in strange ways. Hmm? Um, uh, this young woman shows up and uh, becomes his nurse and his model. They become very, very close friends. Um, and she then uh, leaves uh, in 1947 for Paris, 46, 47, after the war. Goes off to Paris. You, you know, he went to the South to be safe. That's why everybody was in the South. So he, she, ret she returned to Paris. And she was a, she was a, a, a patient in this building on the right before she started working for Matisse. Um, and then she found her vocation, the sisterhood, and she became a Dominican nun in Paris. Ah, now she goes to uh, Father Marie Alain Couillet, uh, and uh, several other Dominican priests at that time who were responsible for uh, dialogues with artists and said, um, you know, you got the greatest master uh, at your disposal if you want to uh, befriend him. I'm his friend. I'm his very close friend. Uh, I think that you should should get to know Matisse better. And there was a brother, a Dominican brother there, who really did. Get, and most of in the, the, there's a, a, a document of the letters that were written back and forth between Matisse and this brother. And out of that comes this chapel. On a piece of property that the nuns owned next door, across the street for, from where Matisse was. And he spent the next five years doing nothing more than working on this chapel. You should see the photographs. You know, he built the height of that table. He built these cardboard models. He built, he, he built everything in his studio. And then the discussion back and forth to Paris about what is right and what is not. It's just down the road. Uh, I went to Sunday Mass there uh, recently. That is how it fits into the environment uh, in the residential area above Vos. Uh, so even the tile roof the cross, all of that is um, Matisse. Like O'Shaughnessy, he had the whole thing in his pocket. Mm -hmm. And you step down, from the, you see the road is raised. So you have to step down to, uh, to come into the church. So the entrance to the church is here on the left. Uh, eye level, you're at the top of the ceramic piece uh, and you step down into this space you go into the door and you have the holy water fountain and then you get a touch of what the stained glass looks like and this is in preparation for mass um, and I, I, I didn't take any during mass but um, uh, it, 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 place was filled. And on the left uh, was an area that he had reserved for the nuns. 
which now becomes the choir and the sisters were, were there at the same time. But there are, it, 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 some of you may have seen the Metropolitan, uh, yeah, the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, a couple of years ago, uh, all of the drawings for these windows. There was window design after window design after window design. And it, it, it just becomes the most sacred space. There is just no other way to describe it than a feeling of complete elevation. Of comp you have walked in to the middle of a statement of beauty. So you have St. Dominic. Uh, the stations are crossed at the end. Uh, and the, the, also think that in 1947, when uh, this was uh, constructed, uh, that it had um, an altar at an angle such as, as it is. I mean, it was ahead of its time, before Vatican II. And particularly here, in this community, it's, it's important uh, to draw attention. Oh, and also, that the, they don't always keep the pews or the chair kneelers in the chapel. A lot of the time, it is empty. Uh, of that, so the floor design is, is a receiver of the light from the windows. St. Dominic, of course, and this beautiful door to the confessional uh, that Matisse made. And then, uh, wrong way. Then after Mass, when the congregation together with a celebrant says, the Hail Holy Queen, they turn and face this wall of the Blessed Mother. Uh, it's really touching. It's, there's no two ways of it. Uh, an amazing thing. The drawings, the windows, everything, everything he did there uh, is, is a complete masterful work of art. We have one that comes almost that close here in America, I think, in my opinion. Uh, Moneo's Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels in Los Angeles. It was a, a, a brilliant uh, exercise uh, in, in its entire uh, process from beginning to end. Uh, first of all, they chose a plot of land that you might see uh, sitting next to the highway. Across the street is the city hall. So here is the plot of land for the church. Here is city hall. Uh, that is the new uh, Gary, Walt Disney Theater. And there is, a, in the top above that, is the Symphony Hall. Uh, and then down that street is the, the new Museum of Art. Um, in a, and, on, on, and right on the, the 405 highway. And then the lower photographs there, you see it, uh, uh, the entrance, uh, from the street across from the uh, Disney building, and then on the lower right, uh, inside the courtyard. The gate at the top part of that photograph below the bells there, that's how you come in. Um, but back on that highway, sometimes one makes really a lot of mistakes in life, and this is one. That a trustee of that committee that was doing that came to me and said, we want your sculpture 
to be right in front of the cathedral, the sculpture called Star Steps, which Angelinos call Stairway to the Stars, uh, and to hang out over the freeway, which this piece does already, Star Steps, hangs out over the freeway in two directions, and uh, they all knew that this building was going to be torn down and that that, that sculpture had, had a possibility of a new life. Uh, I didn't think it was quite proper, <laughs> so I, I, I didn't do it. But they did went and hired Dan Graham, an, an artist in Los Angeles who was very good, uh, to do the bronze doors and the statue of the Blessed Mother uh, above those brown doors. Um, so you come in this uh, gate of this courtyard and you have two directions to go on the left, you go straight up to the doors. On the right, you go into the piazza. Uh, Barbara and I that were there for Easter Sunday celebration. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was amazing. We had our Easter dinner in the courtyard. They have they, this big courtyard like this room. In the back, there's this kitchen that supplies food. We had lamb, you know, all the vegetables, the potatoes, everything is a proper Easter luncheon. Five dollars a piece. <laughs> Purposeful for the community so that they can have a meal. And they all take advantage of it. It is really, really good. So anyway, that lesson, uh, Dan Graham is no longer with us anymore, but he did a, a really lot of beautiful work here. Now the architect doesn't bring you into the nave of the church. It brings you into a hallway, a double hallway on both sides of the nave that circumnavigates it. So there are, there are choices when you want to go in, such as this one. Here you can go down and go into the church, but there are all these side chapels uh, all the way through. There are two art galleries uh, to this uh, space, uh, if I did it right. And that is, uh, is within the, the church. This is, nobody could leave. I think we spent three hours there after Mass. After Mass. Three hours. Um, this was uh, a vision that Carter Mahoney had. And I, as I said, if the process was correct all the way through. They did an international competition. They had it, it chose down to three three of the sets of architects. They paid them for proposals. And then Romeo, who is a professor of architecture in Madrid, did the piece. Oh yeah, okay. And that just gives you a bit of a feeling of what that is like. That's the courtyard. The courtyard is great. Absolutely a, a, a place to I can't, can't tell you anymore. We, we need to see the, the, the joy in, in the suffering that Christ did for us. And there's not always the sorrow. And it's important to be able to express that in the medium of our own time. And those paintings of mine. Uh, this one I've always wanted to see the people going up to a very large tapestry and then unfurled and ro rolled out during Holy Week. And I think it would be I think it would be a very beautiful thing. Um, a procession of cross um, that I did. The resurrection is not 
able to be expressed well in our art forms so far. So this one I'm trying to do crucifixion and resurrection at the same time. And then our Lent investments, so we can know what season we're in, anticipating uh, Easter, and then finally uh, Pentecost, when it, it all comes together for us to go out. I'm going to go quickly through this piece that I did in Santiago de Compostela, uh, because I want, you, I want to end with one thing. Oh, this is interesting. Another church has no electricity. There is no electricity in this part of Thailand Oops. at all. How about that? What a beautiful expression. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can get it together. This, if, if you don't mind, how, how do I do this? Uh, uh, this, I, this is by Bill Viola. Uh, will that do it? Um, uh, it, it should play. I don't know. Anyway, this is the uh, visitation. It's a video that is remarkable. And uh, somehow here, wait, maybe this. Can do it? It says it's doing it, but it's not. Okay, so we'll go, go through that. Uh, other religions at the same time are doing something similar. Uh, this is uh, Islam's mosque in Dubai. Uh, I think it's stunning. And for an iconoclastic religion, they know how to take decoration and, and to make it beautiful. They are masters at it. Uh, and, and we know that from, from many other things. But I want to leave you with uh, a notion that you can take art and use it as a prayer for yourself. Now, I just use the Art Institute, and I do it for all of the liturgical seasons. And I specifically go and find those paintings which deal with the season that we are in. And spend the day in contemplation and prayer from these paintings. It's a wonderful way. Uh, 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 another opening that you have to keep your conversation with God alive. Let this art be a gateway. You, and you know the top left is Pope Francis's favorite painting. It's in the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, Mark Chagall's White Crucifixion. Chagall ends his life entirely a practicing Jew and a personal Christian. And it's evident in all of his paintings. All the top, the top, bottom, bottom right are his. Uh, the, top, uh, the top right is Picasso. <coughs> Oops. Um, Gauguin's, Van Gogh, Rouault. The, the museums are full of avenues that can lead you to prayer. Think about it, and just one little thing. I think that finding beauty elevates the soul to a higher plane. Finding beauty in unexpected places activates a sense of joy and excitement. Wonder and belonging Celebrating beauty transforms a sense of ownership and enchantment. Gives you the ownership of the painting, of the sculpture that you're looking at. Thank you for the seeking. Appreciate it. Thank you, John David, for not only sharing 
a lot about art, but a lot about yourself and what's motivated your life and inspired you. And, and there's nothing like um, one's personal journey to the Lord. Thank you.